Does more government spending create an economic stimulus that increases gross domestic product? The answer to that question would surprise most mainstream economists. Former Princeton University professor Paul Krugman wrote for the Guardian of London last year that, quote, since the global turn to austerity in 2010, every country that has introduced significant austerity has seen its economy suffer, with the depth of the suffering closely related to the harshness of the austerity, close quote. Krugman also claimed that, quote, Standard macroeconomics said that cutting spending in a depressed economy with no room to offset these cuts by reducing interest rates that were already near zero would indeed deepen the slump, close quote. But this is mythology, propped up by subjective analysis of data that results in a confirmation bias. A look at more objective data at the experience of all the world's advanced economies using the International Monetary Fund's World Economic Outlook database reveals a different reality. The WEO contains specific growth, spending, and other data on countries since 1980. And it reveals that more government spending, or even less government spending, has zero impact upon official economic growth as measured in real per capita gross domestic product. Each blue dot on this chart represents a developed country with how much it increased government spending over the previous year and how much that country grew over or under the average of the 39 advanced economies during that year, according to the IMF. Think about that for a moment. Every dollar of fiscal stimulus during the Great Recession did absolutely nothing. Actually, it did a couple of things not related to economic growth. It won re-election for numerous politicians who were perceived as doing something about the 2008-2009 economic crisis. And it furthered the economics careers of Paul Krugman and other big government Keynesians. More significantly, however, it created a massive government money hose to all the wealthy interests that were politically connected, which cannot but act as a catalyst for increasing income inequality. How could it be otherwise? The federal government taxes the tips of waitresses and Uber drivers and gives those tax dollars in the form of bailouts to huge banks like Goldman Sachs and Bank of America, or to politically connected corporations like General Motors, Tesla, the teachers unions, and green energy companies that were friends of and donors to the Obama administration. Yet many of the same economists who cheerleaded the massive transfer of wealth from the working poor to the idle rich speculators on Wall Street are typically the same ones who preach loudest against income inequality. But I digress. If government spending doesn't drive economic growth, and neither do government spending cuts, what does drive economic growth? The IMF data demonstrates that there are two major factors in economic growth, savings and lack of government debt. Savings is by far the more powerful factor. Here's a chart from the same IMF database measuring the national savings rates against economic growth as measured by the average for the 39 advanced economies. Note that the higher the savings, the stronger the growth. Each blue dot represents a year between 1981 and 2016 from one of the 39 advanced economies measuring their per capita economic growth in inflation adjusted dollars and their national savings rate. As you can see, there's a stronger growth for nations with higher than average 24.5% national savings rate and weaker than average growth for nations with lower than average savings. Much of the variance in the data on savings rates is accounted for with government debt levels. This 3D chart measures both national savings rates and government debt as a proportion of GDP against GDP growth. And you can see that government debt has a role in economic growth, even if it has a smaller role than savings rates. The United States has been among the nations with below average savings rates since the 1980s, and has had below average growth since that time. At 17%, the United States loses almost a full percentage point of per capita economic growth every year because of insufficient savings compared to gains with nations which have average savings. Compounded over time, this is a substantial economic disadvantage. There are plenty of reasons why the United States has a low savings rate compared with the other advanced economies. 
Lowered interest rates are one major disincentive to savings, so the Federal Reserve Bank, which has kept interest rates near zero for almost a decade, is partly to blame. There's really no point in putting your money in a bank when it pays less than the rate of inflation. And low interest rates also contribute to inflation, which acts as a tax on poor people's money held in cash and labor. Rich people, by the way, are far less impacted by inflation because, unlike the poor man, most of their assets are held in stocks, bonds, real estate, and other hard assets, which are largely immune to currency inflation. Inflation acts as a double incentive for the working class to spend before the value of their dollar is eaten up. But low interest rates are not the only reason the United States has lower than average savings rates. Some European nations with high savings rates, such as the Swiss and the Swedes, currently have negative interest rates for their central banks. There are many other factors in national savings. Some countries force workers to save. Australia has a retirement plan called superannuation, which forces Australians to save 9% of their income. Singapore has an even more militant forced savings plan. More than 35% of worker wages are vested with its central provident fund. But the United States has a pay-as-you-go system for its Social Security and Medicare program, resulting in no individual account balance, no real savings, and no investment. One of the key claims of Keynesians is that government spending or stimulus during the Second World War set off the post-war boom in the United States. But the reality of the modern data reveals that it was the years during the war of rationing and the forced savings that resulted from it that financed the post-war growth. Indeed, the federal government underwent a massive reduction in size and scope at the end of the war and experienced only a brief recession. By way of contrast, Austrian school and other free market economists have long stipulated that only savings and investment can create economic growth. The data confirms their thesis and refutes the Keynesian behavioral school idea that government can create economic growth. Standard mainstream Keynesian and behavioral school economists hold the view that deficit spending and taking on debt has little to no impact on economic growth, or at the very least, an impact smaller than the supposed positive impact of government stimulus spending. Professor Krugman claimed that in the same 2015 Guardian article that, quote, by late 2008, it was already clear in every major economy that conventional monetary policy which involves pushing down the interest rate on short-term government debt, was going to be insufficient to fight financial downdraft. Now what? The textbook answer was, and is, fiscal expansion. Increase government spending, both to create jobs directly and to put money in consumers' pockets. Cut taxes to put more money in those pockets. But won't this lead to budget deficits? Yes. And that's actually a good thing. Close quote. Again, Dr. Krugman's claim is belied by the data. We've already established that the level of government spending has zero impact on economic growth. So the benefits of increased government spending is zero. But what is the impact of government accumulating debt through deficit spending? Krugman and other establishment economists assert that as long as interest rates are low and borrowing is nominally cheap, then the economic cost of accumulating debt is virtually non-existent. On the economic impact of government debt, there's a wealth of data. Government debt is a secondary factor in economic growth, less than national savings, but still significant. IMF data demonstrates that nations with high government debt have measurably lower economic growth rates. This chart shows the impact of national debt rates upon average GDP growth rate. This difference was also confirmed by the University of Massachusetts study in 2013 by Thomas Herndon, Michael Ash, and Robert Pollan. The study was conducted to debunk the claim by Harvard University professors Reinhardt and Rogoff that there was a threshold of government debt at 90% of GDP at which economic growth fell off a cliff. And the Herndon-Ash-Pollan study did its job well. The Herndon-Ash-Pollan study exposed the errors in Reinhardt and Rogoff's spreadsheet and debunked the debt cliff myth. But they also confirmed that there is a heavy price to pay for carrying a large national debt. The interesting thing about the IMF data, Herndon and company studied a longer time period, uh, is that nations that control their own currency experience only about one-fourth of the cost of carrying debt in terms of economic growth when compared with nations in the Eurozone. I want to conclude with a few additional words about my methodology. Most economists talk about economics as a science where data can prove an economic theory correct or incorrect. And it kind of makes one wonder how conflicting theories persist amidst scientific 
proof that one theory is correct and the other is not. In an email to me a couple of years ago, Austrian school economics professor Walter Block, a professor at Loyola University, practically sneered in the email that most economists limit their study of the trade to math. He put them, you know, that math is a quote. He had a point. There are two ways to prove a theory. Uh, induction and deduction, and both have their weaknesses. Uh, deduction, the method favored by Austrian school economists and forensic scientists, is the process of taking premises that are known to be true and drawing conclusions from them. Uh, the weakness is that if the premises are not true, then the conclusions can be called into question. The second method, induction, is also known as the scientific method. It involves taking a thesis and testing it in the real world. Uh, the problem with that is if you don't isolate the variable you are testing, you may come to the wrong conclusion. Austrian school economists generally prefer deduction and claim that induction doesn't work in an economy because you can't isolate the variable. As Frederick von Hayek put it in his book, The Fatal Conceit, quote, the curious task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they really know about what they imagine they can design. In an economy of 7 billion persons, there are at least 7 billion variables when predicting economic growth. There are both man-made and natural variables for growth, from the fluctuation of global oil prices to natural disasters such as earthquakes, hurricanes, and meteor strikes. Natural disasters can have an especially dramatic impact upon the economies of smaller countries. As many of the smaller countries profiled in this study are city-sized, such as Singapore, Hong Kong, Malta, San Marino, and so on. And the macroeconomic data measured can prove to be misleading, even assuming that all of the governments publishing it have been completely honest and fastidious in compiling the data. For example, in this study, I used per capita GDP and constant inflation-adjusted dollars. But in an earlier study published in a different venue, I used raw GDP constant dollars from the IMF. Why the change? Well, both show national savings rate as the key factor in growth. But I wanted to show a more raw, individualistic view of growth. I wanted to show, are these people getting richer? Raw country GDP numbers don't always tell the whole story, since if the United States were to experience zero GDP growth in a particular year, it would show Americans were getting poorer because of the increase in population. But if Japan were to experience zero economic growth in the same year, it would show that the Japanese are, individually speaking, getting richer because Japan has a decreasing population. Consider that the per capita GDP measure also has some level of distortion. Look at this chart of per capita GDP levels of the United States, Switzerland, and Sweden. You might think that this shows that Americans have long been poorer than the Swiss and that only recently have the Swiss, and especially the Swedes, become poorer. In fact, one might wonder what kind of economic calamity is overcoming the Swedes. But Sweden's overall economy has continued to grow in recent years. The sharp decline in per capita GDP among the Swedes, and to a lesser extent among the Swiss, is due to the fact that the influx of poor immigrants in the form of the refugee crisis in the Middle East and Northern Africa. The United States and Australia have had a steady stream of immigrants to our shores for decades, which kept our per capita GDP a little bit lower when compared to the then homogenous Swiss and Swedes. Why? Because we have always had a large and even proportion of po our population as immigrants. But in the last few years, Sweden has accepted a large proportion of immigrants, one of the highest in the world. This non-native population now exceeds 18% of the Swedish population. Switzerland has also accepted a lot of immigrants, though not in the same proportions as Sweden. Because immigrants often come to a country with nothing. They typically take time to get a job and begin producing economically. This explains the dramatic cuts in per capita GDP in Switzerland and Sweden, even though native Swiss and Swedes have continued to get richer. And the constant flow of immigrants to the United States also explains why America's per capita GDP has been lower for the past three decades. In this study, I used an advanced economy's average GDP growth for every single year measured. Why? Consider an economic growth rate of 1% for Australia in a particular year. Is that good or bad? Ordinarily, that's a disastrous rate of economic growth for a country like Australia or the United States, which have moderate population growth. But 
for Australia, that was growth for the year 2008, at the height of the Great Recession. Australia was the only advanced economy not to go into recession during the 2008-2009 global recession. So I went with an average annual per capita growth rate among advanced economies rather than a raw growth rate. Most practitioners of macroeconomics who are careful of their claims use the term that they have proved something with a 95% reliability. And that's basically what I tried to determine with this study, to find out what the macroeconomic data says about how countries grow. Economics is not a science where an absolute proof can be obtained by isolating all of the variables. But the data definitely coincides with the theories of the free market economists and refutes the theories of economists who champion more government intervention. Thank you for listening.